Okay, we're going to get started. Um, so as I said, uh, welcome to how to talk about self-managed abortion. Um, my name is Caitlin Bunny. I use she, her, hers pronouns. I am Reproaction's Outreach and Culture Manager, and I'm super excited to be bringing you this training here today. Um, if you're interested in tweeting along or just following me on Twitter, uh, my Twitter handle is LiberalJane with two E's. For folks who may be new to Reproaction, we're a national group that leads bold direct action to increase access to abortion and advance reproductive justice. Some of the things that make us a little different is that we are very proud of our left flank analysis and we're not necessarily in this fight to protect the, main, the past or maintain the status quo. We celebrate legal, accessible, and funded abortion as a great thing. And we embrace sex and sexuality um, as well as hold the right to parent, the right to raise children in safe and healthy environments as equally sacred in the struggle for dignity. So a little bit about our training here today. This will be um, a little bit of like an action-packed hour. Um, we are gonna kick things off with some grounding just so we're on the same page um, with what's going on nationally with abortion access, um, as well as what's happening on the local level a little bit. We're then gonna shift into a conversation about what self-managed abortion is. So if this is the first time you're hearing about self-managed abortion, we're gonna all get on the same page with the same working definition. Um, we're then gonna talk about stigma and the role that stigma plays um, in abortion generally, but also the role it plays specific to self-managed abortion. And then we're gonna shift into um, some trip uh, tips uh, and best practices for conversations about self-managed abortion. Um, you'll notice on the go to uh, webinar platform that we're on um, that you do not have access to audio um, or video however there is a chat box um, that i will be pausing to read every so often so if you have questions um, feel free to put them in there and i will be making uh, time to consciously stop and check those and with that um, we are going to move into some grounding there is a lot going on right now, not only with abortion access and rights, but just generally in the world. And in particular on abortion access, it has been already a very rough year um, across state legislatures. We are seeing unprecedented um, attacks on abortion access. Um, and this week also marked six months since Texas's SB8 took effect. Uh, for folks who don't know what SB8 is, um, it is an extreme abortion ban that not only bans abortion after six weeks, which is extremely early, um, it's unique in the sense that it has um, a citizen's enforcement mechanism that allows everyday people, not only those who live in Texas, but anywhere in the country, to sue anybody who helps somebody um, or helps them have or access an abortion after six weeks. Um, what this has done to the Southwest region of the US, um, it, it has been catastrophic for the region. Many people are now being forced to travel long distances to access abortion care. Many people are being forced to wait longer for care. Um, and it's creating a crisis um, and putting a lot of pressure on clinics, um, particularly in the Midwest. Um, so I just wanted to raise that here today also happening, um, the Supreme Court is looking at an abortion case, um, Dobbs v. Jackson's Women's Health Center. Um, we expect that that decision will come at the earliest, at the end of this month, um, but more likely in June. Um, and last night was also the State of the Union, as though there wasn't enough stuff going on. Um, and while Joe Biden talked about many things and touched on um, the situation in Texas, we still have not heard him say the word abortion. Um, so I just wanna use that to set the stage for this training here today. Um, we'll be making sure to say abortion a whole lot, but I wanna acknowledge that this is happening in the background. This is a very stressful time to be in this movement, to be doing this work. Um, and I wanna invite us to take today 
to not think of, um, you know, defense or how we're going to block the next attack, but to take time to consciously connect with each other um, and talk about these issues. So just um, so we're all on the same page, um, the framework that we'll be using to lead this discussion is the reproductive justice framework, um, which was spearheaded by Black women. Um, and the definition of reproductive justice, this comes from Sister Song, um, is the human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy. And that, of course, includes the decision to have children, to not have children, and the ability to parent those children in safe and sustainable communities. The main difference between reproductive justice and reproductive rights is it's about access and not choice. And part of it is we know that people with the means necessary will always be able to travel and take time off um, and afford to go out of state to get the care that they need. Um, unfortunately, that leaves a lot of people out, especially those most marginalized. And reproductive justice is also about understanding that this goes beyond abortion um, and that often issues with accessing contraception, sex ed, um, STI prevention and care and more um, go hand in hand in this fight. So a little bit just generally about abortion. Um, abortion is very common in space. One in four people will have an abortion before they turn 45. Um, but unfortunately, there's a lot of misinformation that still exists around the topic. And abortion stigma can also make it hard to talk plainly about what we're trying to say. So when we're talking about abortion, there's two primary forms of care. What we'll be focusing on today is abortion pills, but I also just wanna take a second to touch on in-clinic care. So medication abortions um, in a clinical set setting are the combination of two drugs. The first is mifepristone, and the second is mesoprostol. Depending on the state, um, states tend to have very specific regulations and restrictions on who's able to dispense those pills. So in some places, it has to be a doctor or a nurse. Um, and they may have um, certain regulations on how a person has to access them, um, if they need to go through counseling or waiting periods and so forth. Um, our training here today will be just talking about abortion pills um, and specifically self-managed abortion just using mesoprostol. I'm going to talk more about that in a second and why that is. Um, but before we do, I also wanted to touch on in-clinic abortion care, um, which is sometimes referred to as like surgical abortions, although that name can be misleading um, considering it's a fairly straightforward and safe procedure. Um, and that includes things like vacuum aspiration um, and D and E. So what is self-managed abortion? Self-managed abortion is a broad term that includes all methods someone may use to end a pregnancy. So that may be with medication, herbs, or through manual aspiration. Ultimately, although we are just talking today about self-managed abortion with mesoprostol, no form of self-managed abortion should be criminalized. Even though self-managed abortion isn't necessarily a crime in and of itself in most states, um, we have unfortunately seen over 20 people face prosecution um, for self-managing or being accused of self-managing an abortion. And so for folks who may be new to this topic, um, often the question comes up, why would somebody want to self-manage their abortion? There may be the perception that in-clinic abortion care is the gold standard or the best that somebody can get. Um, and there are many, many reasons someone may self-manage manage their abortion, but ultimately it's not our place to speculate or really judge why someone may choose self-managed abortion. Um, it's on us to make sure that we support access in all capacities. And if somebody wants self-managed abortion as their first choice or last choice, um, both of those are valid. But with that, there are things that pull people towards self-managed abortion and push people towards self-managed abortion. So some of the things that pull people are the cost of abortion care at a clinic, um, the inability to find childcare. So in many states, when people go get an abortion, they may have to go through other restrictions and need someone to watch their children. 
there may be laws and policies in place that restrict or make accessing an abortion difficult. There may be waiting periods, which we touched on already. Um, somebody may have trouble finding or affording lodging. In many states, as we mentioned, there are waiting periods. And so if somebody has to travel hours or even hundreds of miles to have an abortion, that means that they either have to do that drive multiple times or they need to find a place to stay. The distance to a clinic is another barrier, transportation. Um, Anti-abortion protesters outside clinics, um, I think, tends to surprise a lot of people, um, but it is a big concern, especially for folks who may be um, a part of a local church or religious group or may even have family or friends um, that protest outside clinics, or even worse, um, if antis are recording outside of a clinic, the fear of being videotaped and then having that live streamed on Facebook um, can be very scary. Um, the inability to get time off, insurance coverage bans, um, for folks who don't know, people who are on Medicaid in particular, um, are barred from using their health insurance to cover abortion care, and that's because of the Hyde Amendment. If you're interested in learning more about that, um, I would highly recommend the organization All Above All, which has been spearheading uh, the movement to get that out of the federal budget. Another big issue that we've seen pop up a lot during COVID and increased restrictions is clinic availability. So the clinic having enough appointments to see people um, in a timely manner it is a problem sometimes. And then factors that push people towards SMA. So these are things that actually make um, self-managed abortion a more appealing option for people. And so distrust in medical institutions, a desire for privacy, the comfort of our own homes. Um, I think many of us during the pandemic have gotten very comfortable being in our space, um, and it can be a little difficult to like leave um, a place that feels safe and comfortable. Uh, language barriers are a big issue. Um, the inability to find gender affirming care. There are clinics um, that you know may have pink walls, and everything might be gen like super women centric, and that can be really alienating um, for trans and non-binary folks. Um, age is a big factor. Um, as well as cultural familiarity. Um, in a lot of places in the US, um, self-managed abortion might be as easy as just going and meeting a, um, somebody in the community that's trusted who can help help guide the process. And with that, um, before we dive any deeper into this, I do wanna take a second to acknowledge um, that the risks that we're gonna be talking about here today with self-managed abortion are not medical risks, but instead legal risks. Um, and so there's a fine line between giving information and giving advice. Information about self-managed abortion with mesoprostol belongs in the hands of everybody. And the goal of this training is to provide information regarding the use of mesoprostol to end a pregnancy for the purpose of consciousness raising. We're talking about self-managed abortion so we can have conversations with our loved ones um, and see the future of abortion access that we deserve um, and want. Um, we are not giving advice or encouraging anyone to engage in this practice. And by giving information only, we minimize our own risk. Having said that, self-managed abortion is safe, it's effective, and it works. The risks are largely legal and not medical. And while in some U.S. states it's illegal to perform an abortion um, outside of a clinic or without a physician, it is not a crime to share information on the World Health Organization's website. Um, this is a good time to note that the consequence of abortion bans and abortion restrictions is sending people to jail. Um, as much as anti-abortion activists want to pretend that they just want to go after providers, which is also not okay, the logical next step is going after people who, um, who themselves are the provider and the person who are receiving the abortion. So at Reproaction, we focus our self-managed abortion work uh, with pills and in particular um, with mesoprostol, which is about 85% effective in the first 12 weeks of pregnancy. 
I want to take a second to acknowledge the reason why we know mesoprostol is safe and effective today is because of Brazilian women in the 1980s. They were the ones who noticed on um, the little mesoprostol box that um, it said, do not take if pregnant. And they were able to figure out how many pills they needed to induce the miscarriage and later um, the WHO studied it and created the protocol that we are going to take a look at today. Having said that, a little bit more about mesoprostol as a pill. Um, mesoprostol is inexpensive, it's heat resistant, and it's easier to access the mifepristone and mesoprostol. Um, and so it's believed to be more widely used um, for self-managed abortion. In addition to being used for self-managed abortion, it has a variety of uses um, outside of abortion, including treating stomach ulcers, arthritis, arthritis in dogs, um, and it's also used to treat postpartum hemorrhage and labor induction. Um, and it works by causing the uterus to cramp and push out of pregnancy. So how does this process work? Essentially, if somebody was interested in using this process for self-managed abortion, they would get 12 tablets of mesoprostol, and then in three rounds, they would do the following. They would put four mesoprostol tablets under the tongue. They'd leave those pills under the tongue for 30 minutes, and in that time, they would not drink anything or eat anything. Of course, they can swallow their own saliva. And then after 30 minutes, they can swallow what remains then set a timer for three hours. In that time, they can eat and drink as normal. And then they will repeat the process um, another two times after that first time. Um, after the second round of pills, the person will start to experience the symptoms of an abortion. Um, and then once they follow it, um, ideally they will have a successful um, abortion. So while today's purpose is not to talk about the ins and out of self-managed abortion. Um, we are more than happy to offer that to you. So if you are representing an organization or you have a group of friends who are like excited about abortion access, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out at the end of this presentation. There will be an email address um, if you'd like to reach out for a training. But having said that, uh, the purpose of today is learning how to advocate for self-managed abortion. So we're going to talk about some of the data that we do have. Um, and in particular, I want to highlight a study from IBIS Reproductive Health that came out uh, late last year, actually. And it affirms that self-managed abortion with pills is safe and effective. According to the study, 98.8 of those who used only mesoprostol had successful abortions without surgical intervention. The study also shows that self-managed abortion with pills and in-clinic abortion care have similar effectiveness rates when the pills are used before nine weeks of pregnancy. Further, within the first 12 weeks of pregnancy, mesoprostol is proven to be approximately 85% effective in terminating a pregnancy. So with that, we're gonna shift into our conversation about stigma. So in particular, the decision to become a parent may be one of the biggest choices someone will make in their life. For decades, um, we've seen the right demonize people who seek abortion care, work to defund providers, and criticize those who support abortion access. All of us here today know that people are capable of making decisions that are best for their bodies, their lives, and their families. So just so we have the same definition of stigma, when we hear the word stigma um, in our work, it's the perspective that something is morally wrong or unacceptable. So in the context of our work, it's the idea that the work that we do is somehow controversial and deviant. In particular, reproductive stigma, which is an umbrella term, is the labeling, judgment, discrimination, or poor treatment that people face when their reproductive experiences fall outside the norm. So this may be associated with abortion, which we'll be talking about today, but also with infertility, pregnancy loss, adoption, or the decision to become a parent at a young age. Abortion stigma shows up in a lot of ways and tends to get perpetuated through mass media, laws and policies, institutions, communities, and of course people can hold and perpetuate stigma. So some examples of how stigma shows up in our everyday lives. It may be uh, news outlets, 
when they're talking about very early abortion bans in like six, seven weeks, using images of heavily pregnant and often headless pregnant people, um, which of course does not allow uh, the dignity and respect that pregnant people deserve. Another example, um, which we've been seeing started in Texas um, and has since spread to Ohio and North Carolina and a number of other states where local communities are passing ordinances calling themselves sanctuary cities for the unborn, which is co-opting um, sanctuary cities um, from, for immigrants, which popped up uh, during the Trump administration for cities that um, were choosing not to collaborate with ICE. Um, these communities are passing these ordinances that are non-enforceable um, and ultimately exist to further stigma and fear. Um, another example that happens across the country every day um, is anti-abortion activists protesting outside abortion clinics and heckling and harassing not only patients, but providers, staff members, um, and anyone who enters or leaves the building. And then on the individual level, um, individuals experience stigma in many ways. It can be internalized. Um, and often this, what, this is what makes it so hard to talk about, especially for those of us who've had an abortion. Um, you, may have, you may remember a situation in which you think, oh, I don't know if I'm, it's okay to open up to this person. I don't know how they're gonna react. All of that stems ultimately from stigma. So when we're advocating for self-managed abortion, there are so many ways in which we can engage um, in it. And all of these um, ideas for advocating for self-managed abortion are helpful in moving us further to that future that we want. So I wanna take a second um, to do a quick activity um, and you can do this if you have a piece of paper, feel free to write it down, or if you just want to think it, um, I'm not going to test you in any way, so no worries um, if you want to just use this as a five minute uh, rest time. Um, but we're going to take five minutes, so until uh, 4.30, um, to just sit and reflect and think about the values that you bring to your activist work. And I'll preface this by saying there are no wrong answers, so please feel free to just allow yourself to flow.
take just another 10, 15 seconds to wrap up uh, some final thoughts and then we're gonna regroup. Okay, so if you feel comfortable, uh, no pressure to, as mentioned, um, it would be awesome to see uh, some of your values uh, that you wrote down. You don't have to explain how they apply um, and just say what the value is. Um, but the great news is that all of our values can connect uh, to our fight for abortion access. So I'm going to give some examples, um, but of course, encourage you again, if you feel comfortable to share in the chat box, I would love to see what some of your values are. So in particular, if your value um, was fair treatment, um, you may think that we shouldn't treat people differently just because um, they choose a different type of abortion care. And in particular, pointing out that politicians are picking on certain types of abortion care, um, in particular, the tax attacks on medication abortion care um, as being as being um, an issue with fair treatment. Another one, of course, is autonomy. So respecting that people need to make their own important life decisions on their own. Uh, another one that came up here in the chat that I love is worthiness. Yes, we are all worthy of the, the abortion care that we want. Awesome. And feel free if you uh, decide during the rest of the session that you want to share your values, you're more than welcome to. Um, oh, we got one more. Um, Allison says, self-determination, justice, and success is defined by impacted voices. Each person has inherent dignity and worth. I love that. That's um, a great value to bring to this work. Um, oh, and then there's here's another one. You guys are uh, filling up this chat. Maggie said, everyone should have access to comprehensive information about abortion and compassionate care. Yes. Awesome. So some things, when we're talking about self-managed abortion with the people that we love, perhaps we're talking to other activists or other people involved in the movement, there are four things in particular that we want to make sure get uplifted. The first is that self-managed abortion with pills is safe and effective. Um, and these are options that we simply did not have 40 years ago before Roe v. Wade. When people are given the tools and information they need, they can successfully end a pregnancy on their own. And we have to trust um, and give pregnant people the dignity and respect that they deserve in that. The second thing is the risks associated with self-managed abortion are largely legal and not medical. To date, there have already been 20 plus people who've been prosecuted for self-managed abortion. And while SMA um, or self-managed abortion may not be explicitly illegal um, in a state, we have seen time and time again, prosecutors misuse or misapply laws um, in order to put people in prison. The third point is that self-managed abortion is another option for pregnancy care. Um, it does not need to live in conflict with in clinic abortion care. And it may just be that one option is better for somebody than the other. Um, we don't know the specifics of somebody's life. We don't know their mental health, their commitments, the people they're responsible to. And so we have to trust that when they say the type of abortion care that they prefer and want, we have to trust that that is what is right for them. The last thing is that ultimately ending the Criminalization of pregnancy, abortion, and all aspects of reproduction is essential to reproductive autonomy and knowing that criminalization does not help our communities. And so just some quick tips. So this tends to be where people um, might get stuck or may have issues um, sort of shifting. So first, we want to stop using outdated imagery. So things like coat hangers, back alleys, um, and other um, sort of pre-row imagery that ultimately um, doesn't reflect the reality of what people who are self-managing their abortions today are experiencing. Instead of talking um, about desperation narratives, instead let's talk about the legal risks 
and the threat of criminalization that comes with self-managed abortion and make sure that we're continuing to center those most impacted. The second thing that we wanna avoid doing is avoiding desperation narratives um, for people who just who have self-managed um, abortions. Ultimately, we want to make sure we're treating people who self-managed with the respect and dignity they deserve and understand that there are a variety of reasons, as we touched on earlier in this presentation, that someone may choose self-managed abortion. And the last thing is we want to avoid creating a hierarchy between self-managed abortion and in-clinic in abortion care and instead talk about how abortion pills give us another option for abortion care and does not take away from in-clinic um, abortion care or the need for it. Some last tips as though I have not thrown enough at you. It's really important that we avoid creating an abortion hierarchy. So this is the idea that some abortions are more valid than others or that there are good or bad reasons to have an abortion, which is something that we have to just ultimately reject. When we say that there are good reasons or bad reasons, we are essentially handing our opponents, um, essentially allowing them to change the goalposts and continue to chip away at access, um, leaving more and more of our community behind. The second thing is we don't want to assume abortion is a devastating choice with dangerous mental health implications. For some people, um, they may find out they're pregnant and say, I'm gonna have an abortion and it's a super easy decision. And for other people, it's not. And all of that is valid. The third thing is we wanna make sure we're including self-managed abortion in conversations about healthcare. Abortion is healthcare um, and we deserve to have the type of care that we want and deserve. And the last is we wanna talk about decriminalization when advocating for self-managed abortion. There's absolutely no reason that self-managed abortion should be criminalized. Um, and that is something that we need to call out. not going to go through these tips um they are here on the slide for you and as i mentioned this is being recorded and the presentation will be shared after these are tips um, if you would like to continue to sort of um, strengthen your speaking skills in um, just abortion generally as well as of course self-managed abortion a couple things i just want to highlight from this slide is in particular that when we're talking about self-managed abortion, we wanna talk about the barriers that exist to care. And in particular, how are those barriers were, cre were created and who's responsible for those barriers? So if the state politicians, federal politicians, naming names and explaining exactly why things are the way they are and why they should not be. And the other thing I wanna highlight is avoiding technical and stigmatizing language. And in particular, for self-managed abortion, we see a lot of people um, make it into the abbreviation SMA, which I have done during this presentation here today. Um, it's really important that we are being specific and direct with what we're talking about, especially as people who may not be as in the movement um, as those of us here today. And so when we're thinking about how to have conversations about abortion, this is a chart from um, the Sea Change program. I have pulled a couple graphics from their program um, in this presentation here today. This is another one of them. Um, and what we wanna think about when we're having conversations with somebody, it can be helpful to figure out where they sort of stand on this, uh, this chart here. In particular, this first, uh, this first one of opposition that has violence, disgust, and aversion, those aren't necessarily the best places to put our action. Instead, we wanna focus our attention on sort of this middle tier and moving people who perhaps are in the acceptance into affirmation and ultimately activism. So with that, we are going to shift into some um, scenario role-playing. And then, um, as I mentioned, if you have any questions, now would be a good time to queue them up in the chat. I will answer them after. Should have a few minutes at the end, um, and hopefully I can get you all out here a little bit earlier. Okay, so how do we respond when somebody says, in-clinic abortion care is the best type of care somebody can receive? Ultimately, the answer to this is self-managed abortion gives us another option for care alongside in-clinic abortion care. 
It is not our place to judge or decide the type of care that is best for somebody. This next one is, um, it may come from somebody who is um, an ally or like a progressive friend. Um, and they may say, making abortion illegal will only put an end to safe abortions. We've seen this refrain a lot, perhaps on social media or even on protest signs at rallies. Ultimately, the best approach here is to emphasize that we have options that we simply did not have before Roe. People today are able to safely and effectively manage abor an abortion on their own. And the risk here is not medical, it's legal. Yes, people get hurt from abortion bans and restrictions, but we are not returning to the pre-Roe era. And then this last one, this may come from a friend that's being dismissive or perhaps hasn't been involved in the fight, is just tuning in now, and they may say, we need to focus on saving Roe v. Wade right now. The answer to this is, the reality is, Roe never ensured us abortion access. Health-managed abortion has always existed. It will always exist. And people are turning to it as a result of decreased access. Ultimately, Roe is the floor, not the ceiling, for our vision of abortion liberation. And with that, um, you have completed the training. Woohoo! Um, so, as I mentioned, if you're interested in learning more about self-managed abortion, you need possible, including like the protocol, how it works, precautions. Uh, Reproaction does offer trainings uh, with small groups and organizations that are free. I'm happy to do them. You'll be hearing my face and seeing my face. Um, that email address is the best place to reach out. You can also learn more about self-managed abortion on our website, including the protocol. Um, and if if somebody you know um, is interested in learning more about the legal risk or has specific legal questions, uh, if, when, how has a repro legal helpline. Um, the number is listed there. They also, of course, have a website. Um, and if somebody has specific questions, they can also head there for answers. Um, I'm going to take a second to